champion. As you can see, Robinson, Basilio, Griffith, you're talking about uh, top of the line fighters who were able to pull it off, pull off what this man is going to try to pull off tonight. Marlon Starling fighting for the first time in his life at a weight heavier than 149. Enters the ring as anywhere from a five to one to perhaps seven to one underdog. I have to report to you, Jim, I just got a signal from the head of the bookmaking operation here in Las Vegas that the odds had plunged to three to one in the last hour. People betting on the underdog Marlon Stalin. What might have precipitated that, Larry? Do you think it's speculation with regard to all the difficulties Nunn has had and his initial failure to make weight this morning? Without a doubt. Uh, uh, smart, smart money uh, bettors feel that uh, that half pound isn't going to hurt him physically. It suggests something is wrong and they want to take the odds and they all jumped in on it. Starling's career record as a welterweight has been in the ring for 51 decisions. Five of them are counted as losses. Starling says only his second decision loss to Donald Curry should be seen as a loss, and the others can all be explained away in his own peculiar and sometimes compelling logic. Well, all fighters can find alibis for why they lose. They weren't trained properly. They were hurt, etc. But he does say that his second loss to Donald Curry was a real loss. He was ready, and Curry was just too good for him. But at his best, he's a remarkably inventive fighter, capable of coming up with new things in the ring. Right now, Ray Leonard shows us what Marlon must do and what Michael Nunn must do to try to win the fight. Well, Jim, he must be inventive tonight. He would need to use a lot of upper body movement and try to counter, especially the right hand, because the right hand works well against southpaws. And one thing about it, if you should hurt on Michael Nunn, you must seize the opportunity. You don't let up, Jim. You stay on top of him and throw punch after punch after punch. One thing about Marlon Stalin that bothers me sometimes, he has a tendency to get lazy and careless, and he can't afford to do that against a guy like Michael Nunn. Because Michael Nunn, at 6'2", will find out that the uppercut is something of a beauty because he throws a series of uppercuts that's been very effective. I can never ever said enough about the left jab. Well, right jab because Michael Nunn's a southpaw. It sets up everything. It puts you in line for the overhand left. Beautiful, beautiful punch. Michael Nunn has a problem sometimes. He has a tendency to clown and try to over impress the crowd. He can't afford to do that against Marlon Stalin. Stalin punches are shorter and far more accurate than Aaron Barkley. And now here comes Michael Nunn, 27 years old today and getting ready to put an end to the longest layoff of his professional boxing career. The man at the right of your screen in the foreground is Cassius Bo Green, who was the trainer for the past two and a half weeks in the absence of Joe Goosen. And just behind Cassius Green, you can see the familiar face of Joe Goosen, who was welcomed back into the Nunn corner just yesterday. And he apparently will be the number one second. I just think that when it came down to the fight, Michael Nunn felt a lot of stuff's going wrong here. And I give him credit for being courageous enough in the face of everything and all of the friends and relatives who have been besieging him in these last months to say, I got to take care of business here and I want to feel comfortable with my corner. And if you're Dan Goosing and you're looking for positive signs and symbols, you have to be pleased that Michael elected to wear the 10 goose boxing jacket into the ring. But what about those blue gloves? I've never seen blue gloves in a heavyweight championship fight, Ray. Middleweight. <laughs> in a middleweight championship fight, sorry. Point well taken. <laughs> heavyweight championship fight either. Yeah. <laughs> Both fighters will wear the blue gloves and Michael Nunn brings a record of 34 wins, zero losses into the ring. You saw the 23 knockouts listed, but if there is any remaining question about his skills as a fighter, it would have to do mostly with his punching power. And there's the tail of the tape, and you see all the advantages to none. Younger, taller, bigger, longer reach, and even despite the fact that that reach advantage is listed at only three inches there, Michael Nunn just presents the picture of a bigger, rangier fighter than you expect from most middleweights when he steps into the ring. Because he's a tall, he's a rangy guy, long arms, and very, very tall. And here is our punch stat numbers to uh, give you a profile of how active these fighters are. 
Uh, you can see what Nunn did against Barkley. Barkley put a lot of pressure on him. Starling is going to try to do the same thing. And Breland is, is just as tall as Nunn, so uh, perhaps those figures uh, mean something. Starling was able to handle Breland. And here are the jabs. Nunn uses it perhaps as his uh, best weapon. Starling uses it to get on top of his opponent and throw harder punches. Rules for the bout as referee Mills Lane prepares to call the 40th championship fight of his illustrious career. Three judges will score the fight from ringside. Ten point must system. No standing eight count. No three knockdown rule. You can be saved by the bell in the last round only. And now up to ring announcer Jemmy Lennon Jr. for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans around the world, welcome to the magnificent Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. As the Mirage Hotel and Casino, Al Goosen Promotions and Cedric Kushner Productions presents the main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the IBF Middleweight Championship of the World. This fight is sanctioned by the International Boxing Federation, the president supervising at ringside, Mr. Bob Lee. Along with the Nevada State Athletic Commission, the chairman, Dr. James Nay. Commissioners, Dwayne Ford, Dr. Elias Gannon, Jay Nady, and Luther Mack. Executive director is Chuck Minker. Presenting to you the officials as appointed, the chief ringside physician, Dr. Flip Homansky, along with Dr. James Game. Timekeepers at the bell also keeping count of the knockdowns. We have Mike Lasella and Al Bicek. Judges at ringside for this main event from the state of Washington, Glenn Hamada. From Indiana, Gary Merritt, and from Nevada, Art Lurie. Now introducing to you the referee in charge of this bout, Mills Lane. All right, fans, here we go. This is it, the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing, the IBF Middleweight Championship of the World. Introducing to you first, the challenger on my left, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing light blue trunks with white trim and fighting out of Hartford, Connecticut. His weight tonight is already 158 pounds. With a record of 45 wins, five defeats, and one draw, he has 27 wins by way of knockout. Please welcome the WBC welterweight champion of the world, the challenger known as Marlon Magic Man. The ring is the defending champion fighting out of the red corner. Entering the ring wearing white trunks with black trim and fighting out of the Ten Goose Boxing Club in North Hollywood, California by way of Davenport, Iowa. His weight tonight is at even 160 pounds. His outstanding record, 34 wins, no defeats, 23 wins by way of knockout he is the undefeated IBF middleweight champion of the world, Michael Second to Marlon. <laughs> Referee in charge now to give instructions to Bill's lane. All right, now you've already gone through the instruction the dressing room one time. Any questions from the challenger's corner? No, sir. Any questions from the champion's corner? Let's get it on, come on. As Damon Runyon said, the race usually goes to the swift and the battle to the strong. But where Marlon Starling is concerned, he knows how fast his head is and how strong his heart is. Round one begins. Ray Leonard, you suggest that you didn't like the way Nunn looked in his corner before the fight. It was a very, very uh, unsure look. He didn't look too positive. Normally, Michael Nunn gets to the ring and has this arrogance about him. I don't see it now. With Marlon Stalin, because he's fighting a heavier weight, he didn't have to exert himself to make the 147-pound weight limit. He was able to train and relax too. This is Vintage Starling. He's talking already. He pushed Nunn into a corner and tried to aggravate him. 
he's been doing it throughout this, uh, since they've been here. He's been trying to make Michael Dunn mad so Mike, in fact, would try to fight his fight inside. And as Darling entered the arena today, he went by the trailer which served as Nunn's dressing room and banged on the door and started yelling, come on. Here what I said about clowning. So Michael's against the ropes. He did it against Iran Bakke, and Bakke telegraphed his punches. With Starling, Starling's punches a lot shorter and a lot more accurate. Starling's a much more technically skilled fighter than Iran Barkley. The size disparity, on the other hand, is readily apparent in the ring. None looks down at Starling. Marlon Starling has an incredible style, very unique, I must say. He keeps those hands up very, very high, and he's able to de deliver punches. the uppercuts that Michael Nunn's throwing. And those uppercuts could be powerfully important against the peekaboo defense. Well, they work very well because I, I think also a punch like Tyson throws to the uh, liver and then the uppercut because you have to, you have to disguise that punch. are landing punches inside. And most of the punches thrown by Nunn is being caught on the hands and the elbows of Marlon Stalin. It's a very difficult defense to penetrate. You see what's happening here, Jim? Marlon's walking his man down. He's throwing that lead off right. The right hand works well against southpaws. You'll notice they throw it from time to time. In the last 30 seconds, Starling has begun to land frequently, and he seems to have none a little bit befuddled. Watch the right hand. There it is again. The most noticeable thing in that round is that Michael Nunn was standing flat-footed. Apparently, he's decided to try to impose his greatest strength on the welterweight champion. We'll see if he can do it. You do on asserting yourself. Just keep hitting the body more. Okay. Okay. Just be aware on the inside. Mike, is this guy a piece of cake or what on the inside? Okay. If you're gonna stay on the inside, keep dominating. Use the jab from the outside a little bit more though. Okay. Hey, pretty much you're doing what you want to do with the guy. Just don't get lazy in there with him. Don't let him keep getting off. Right hand's working for you, okay? Now just use those pains, okay? Mm -hmm. I want more pains out there, but make the right hand work a little easier, okay? And the jab's the working well too. Starling's corner is Freddie Roach, a disciple of Eddie Futch, 30-year-old former featherweight. He was working with Futch at the time when Starling rid himself of Futch's services, but he said, Freddie's just fine, I'll keep him. The punch count statistics for round one reflected what you said, Ray, that Starling was picking off most of Nunn's punches with his gloves and his forearms. And his trainer, Freddie Roach, told Starling to keep on the right hand. There it is again. And also, like to reiterate on right, Michael Nunn is standing straight up. He's not bending at all. There's the right hand again. It's gonna cut, it's gonna connect every time. Well, it did against Hunnigan. Nunn presents a much bigger picture in there than does Lloyd Hunnigan. What I see here is Stalin is far more relaxed than Michael. Michael now is turning to orthodox, which I've never seen him do. And Starling in return turns to Southpaw. that he would uh, have a body attack. I have yet to see body attacks. That was one punch there. Muscle mm -hmm. arm punches. And 
And you heard Joe Goosen between rounds urging Nunn to go to the body, but that's not what he's doing now. Wailing away at Starling's gloves. Keep watching that right hand, Jim. He's snapping Nunn's head back with the right hand. Respect from Marlon Stallings. He needs to put some body behind those punches. Watch the right hand again by Stallings. He's trying to set him up. to go to the body, he may get off the arm weary, banging away against Starling's gloves. There's like right this. hand again. And again after the bell. I thought that was a nice round for Nunn. He found a good rhythm, he found a distance that he could jab effectively, okay, you get busier on and there, okay? started to work off the jab. Take the action away from you, okay? You gotta be busier, all right? Give him his fit bucket. Off like. uh, 12 rounds, okay? Yeah. Now you can pick the pace up. You can't give rounds away. Let's win yeah. them all, okay? All right? A little lazy that round, okay? Yeah. More punches, okay? Uh -huh. You don't have to be real tight out there. Just there's, there's a lot of snap in your punch, okay? Quick. Just a little bit. I think when you bumped heads in there. Yeah, we bumped heads, yeah. Keep using that jab, though, Mike. When you keep it from the outside, yeah. use the jab, slide the uppercut. That's what's working from the outside. On the, no, let me keep it on here. On the inside, Mike, body and pivot around them. We can't play, baby. We can't play. Right. No, this is the back of the ice. It appears that Nunn already has a slight swelling over his right eye. Very few tall, skinny fighters become dominant fighters. I can think of uh, Tommy Hearns, uh, Bob Foster, the old uh, the heavyweight champion. And there's a question if, if uh, he keeps fighting this kind of fight, whether he can take punishment for 12 rounds. Now, this is really uncharacteristic of uh, Michael Nunn. He's putting his head down and he's trying to be a slugger. Watch the upcuts from Marlon Stalin. Nothing's happening here. Stalin's blocking those shots. A couple shots got in. Michael Nunn has yet to figure out the style of Stalin. The right hand once again. But when he throws the right hand, when Stalin throws the right hand, he needs to come back with the left hook. Follow up with something. Keep it close, come on. <laughs> My trainer, Pepe Carrera, always told me that one punch can land, the other punch can land, too. Ray, why is he changing from Southpaw? to right hand back and forth. What is he getting out of that? I never, what, what is he trying to confuse this man? I don't know. But if something works, Larry, you don't stop. Nunn digs through the body to get off the ropes. Starling had complained before the fight that he did not want to see loose ropes in this ring because Nunn likes to lean against them and lean back and work off of that. None was able to do I what Joe problem. told him to do in the corner. Throw punches, then, then pivot. He did that, but he didn't throw any more punches after that. Mills Lane warning the fighters not to hold and hit. None has a tendency to reach out with his right hand and hold the back of Starling's head. Starling ripping with the right hand again, and again, and again. Three right hands landed.
That He's right hand is the bread and butter for Marlon Stalin. These are not hard right hands, but they're landing with unerring accuracy. And Ray, as you pointed out before the fight in your tip of the night, the right hand is always effective against the southpaw if you find this place for it. If it lands, keep throwing it, but come back with something else, a left hook. Well, guys, already after three rounds, we've had more action than a lot of people expected after 12. So this is turning out to be not just a tactical fight, but also a good deal of, of action. You've got to go to that body more, Mike. Jimmy, where's the bucket? Mike, look, when he's going into that into that shell, go to the body, dig those punches, and work around them. Turn them, and then use those uppercuts, Mike. That's what will catch this guy. Let's see Nunn try to penetrate that peekaboo defense. He's having a hard time. It can be a little frustrating, and you got to be careful not to wear yourself out trying because, as you see there with Starling sticking his tongue out, he's trying to inspire Nunn to just keep throwing punches. Neither of them apparently has the firepower to hurt the other so far. If any one of them uh, hurts the other, it will be through attrition. And indeed, chosen, both have chosen to indicate to the other that they can't be hurt under these circumstances. By punch count statistics against Iran Barkley in a fight in which people thought he didn't look all that great, none landed more than 50% of his punches. He's landing about 20% of his offerings against Starlin. That right and left a moment ago might have been the best combination so far in the evening for none. That left landed. He's finally beginning to get past Starling's peekaboo defense. It's been a tough time for referee Mills Lane to uh, pull these two apart. There is no love loss here. I can't believe Starlin's not going to the body of Michael Miller. Look at the body, so exposed. Hey, Mooch, you're giving them the round. Come on, let's get busy. Come on, Mooch. Let's play two. Starling's corner yelling for him to throw punches. They say he's giving none the round. And there he comes with uppercuts. Although Stalin has thrown some pretty good right hand, not powerful right hand, but they were very accurate. The problem he's making, he's not throwing his combinations. He's not putting his punches together. I don't like it when Michael Nunn stays straight up erect. Nunn dominating the action of this round. Now you see Stalin, he retaliates. And when he throws, a bunch, throws his punches in bunches, you see how many land. Right hand once again, Jim. Right on the chin. Nunn starting to work more and more effectively with the jab. Starling has given him more opportunities in this round. Well, that was a warning by Mills Lane for a low blow. In fact, Joe Goosen was telling Michael to go to the body lock more. But Michael selects to go to the head. I prefer Mike to stay in the head because when he goes down, he puts his head down. And when he does that, Starling hits him with the right hand. Well, we've had Douglas Tyson, we've had Chavez Taylor, and now we have Nunn Starling. We're on a roll, and sometimes it's infectious, right, you when you but when you get two champions, you, okay, you don't know what to expect. Side, okay? All right, Mucci, go stand right in front of this guy. Combination is off to the side, okay? Very good, Mucci. Let's go. Windows 
exchanges. Okay? Harold Letterman, our unofficial official, how do you have it? Well, Larry, I've got it 39 to 37, three rounds to one in favor of Michael Nunn. Basically, we score fights on clean punching, effective, aggressive, and this ring generalship and defense, and I think Michael Nunn has been the faster, more effective, cleaner puncher with the left hand so far. Right over there. Harold, so I have to score right. the same way. Once I can't say I can separate it into all those categories. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Michael Nunn can keep doing what he's doing, that is to say, if if his conditioning holds up, which has been questioned, then he's found the formula to dominate this fight. Starling just told Michael Nunn that he's hard to hit. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm hard to I'm hit. Hard <laughs> you talk about no love lost, Ray. I can't imagine any opponent liking Starling. He's a pest. He's a great guy. He's a character, I'll tell you that. A punch that I should play with in the gym was an overhand right. Not a straight right hand, but an overhand right, especially against a tall opponent. Roundhouse right from Starling fell short. None starting to become more effective inside. fighting this one. When he comes in this way, he has a tendency to put his head down, Jim. And in doing so, he's very susceptible to shots thrown by the short of uh, Marlon Starling. Well, Larry and Harold both having win, have him winning three or four rounds, and you can't believe he's fighting this way. You see the fight differently? Well, I, I just see that uh, Starling's been throwing more punches, although the hand speed of, of Michael Nunn sometimes has a tendency to mesmerize you. That's why I'm not a judge. It's maybe a tough fight for judges to evaluate. And two of them are the two judges who gave none his victory over Iran Barkley in Reno in August. Seems to be slowing down. He needs to stay a lot busier. For the first minute of this round, Starling was busy and none slowed down. But now in the ensuing two minutes, the middleweight has taken over again. None having free reign now to fire away at Starling. What's happening, when Stalin throws one punch and Michael throws a combination, Michael Nunn will steal the round. An excellent round for Curry. There used to be a saying that a fighter like a uh, leopard a can't change his spots, but Michael Nunn is changing his style inside. and standing in there and fighting. Maybe because Stalin can't hurt him, he has the courage to do that. Good. Good. Mike, Mike, keep using the jab. You'll find stuff off of it, Mike. Keep boxing him. Change his body work, okay? More things, okay? Go to him, slip to him. Don't pull away from any shots, okay? No time to fool around out there, okay? Go to work, okay? Let's get that body. Pick it up. Rip that body. How's that in there? combination is that you get a fire him, okay? Earlier today, WBA middleweight champion Mike McCallum stopped Michael Watson. And there are some ramifications of that. You won't believe who the mandatory challenger for the championship, middleweight championship you're now looking at is. It's Donald Curry. He's only fought two middleweights in his life, neither one of whom we've ever heard of. But indeed, according to the rules of the International Boxing Federation, the winner of this bout must give Donald Curry a match before July 17th this year. Should throw in here, Jim, 
that fellow named Roberto Duran is still a WBC middleweight champion. You heard of him, haven't you, Ray? <laughs> the name does ring a bell, Larry. And Starling's people have indicated that if they can get by this one and Starling can take the middleweight title, he would like to fight Durant. Mike, Michael Nunn's going to find that throwing two jabs will open something up. There will be an opening after two jabs. Switched to conventional for a while, now goes back to the southpaw stance. So he goes from throwing left jabs, of which he landed the two in a row that you were looking for, to right jabs. Coming with the left off of it, and now Mike's trying to be Mike's clowning here. And this is when Stalin should, should jump in there. just a lot more tentative than he was in the first few rounds, Ray. Could it be that the bigger man's size and weight have gotten to him a little bit? If the fight a bigger man does wear you down, when you're leaning on each other, the bigger man comes out on top. It's a matter of size here. Now Michael Nunn's going to the body. Nunn dominating the action here. The Starling, for the time being, has stopped throwing punches again. Very good trick there, stepping on the foot of a taller opponent. Often happens when a conventional fighter faces a southpaw. What uh, Starling's doing, he's actually giving away this round. In fact, he's giving away a couple rounds. He certainly hasn't shown any indication of trying to win this one. And for a man who's been out of the ring 242 days, none now showing little if any sign of ring rust. Okay, Muchi, now you gotta fire it up in there, okay? Come on, stop ripping that body, both hands, okay? Come on, you're giving these rounds away, okay? They're too close. All right? Now you gotta pick it up out there, okay? You gotta rip that body hard, okay? You gotta pick up the pace now. Fight this guy, okay? Come on, you're halfway there, okay? Let's go, let's get this guy tight. Let's rip that body. Open up in the son of a bitch, okay? Come on, open up. Let's go now, Mucci. All in front of him. Now you're working. Now you keep you keep popping them like that. You keep popping them like that for the next few rounds, Mike. Then you're gonna find your openings, okay? Your box is smart now. Okay. You understand exactly Take what I'm on. saying? Yeah. Let go, Jim. Freddie Roach keeps saying, okay, 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 but his fighter, Marlon Starling, is not okay right now. You have the impression Starling never listens to anything in his corner? Well, he's his own manager, isn't he? <laughs> there you go. He doesn't have to. He doesn't want to. But he really needs to be busy here. He needs to throw more punches, get a lot more serious. who's been doing all the talking in Nunn's corner is Joe Goosen, who just returned to the Nunn camp from his three-week exile overnight. Now Starling begins to go to the body and become more aggressive, as Freddie Roach had urged him to do. Combination. 
for a left hook from Marlon Stalling. You have Michael Nunn standing straight up, just waiting for that punch. Marlon is still throwing the right hand. Freddie nice. Roach, Marlon's trying to wash two hands. I think that Nunn, Stalling was hurt then. He was rattled for a second. Or either off balance. Starling at a standstill. Michael Nunn is just having a field day. It's a picnic. You see what happens, Jim, when, when, when Marlon Stein throws combinations? He's a lot more effective. But one punch is not going to get it with the guy with the foot and hand speed of Michael Nunn. Darling, after an interesting first three rounds, has drifted south. Less and less active, more and more willing to let Nunn control the bout with his jab and his boxing skills. And now these punches are getting through the peekaboo defense. I think what's happening out there, Jim, is Starling, knowing he's behind, has to take more chances. He's going to be more vulnerable, and he might get hit with some heavy punches. And then we have to come right to the chin, OK? Harold Letterman, how's the fight progress, according to you? Larry, I've got it 69 to 64, six rounds to one in favor of Michael Nunn. I mean, in plain and simple English, Michael Nunn has come to fight, and Marlon Starling hasn't. For some reason, as I see the fight, Marlon just is not throwing punches. He's laying back, and he's letting Michael Nunn whack him continuously with good straight left hands. And Michael Nunn is totally dominating this fight. Snap him hard, baby. You've got a really no argument, put him Harold. Hard. <laughs> I, up with those uppercuts. I see this more as a fight, not between a heavier man and a, and a less heavy man, but between a tall, skinny guy and a short, compact guy. And the tall, skinny guy's winning. And it isn't a question of his strength either. It's his youth, his quickness, and his reach. And we'll see now if Starling opens up. He's trying a little trick again, step on the foot. And that is the case, like you stated earlier, Jim. Quite a tall guy, southpaw, but off the docks. None casually looking down at his front foot, as if to say, all right, I'll watch it if you're going to try to step on it. It's an old story in boxing to see the smaller, quicker man against the bigger, heavier puncher. But as you charted Starling's disadvantages coming into this fight, it was unusual to note that he was going up against a bigger, quicker man. If I was in Stalin's corner, I would just tell him to just go out there and fight. He's not going to win this fight trying to outbox Michael Nunn. Nunn has too many advantages with the height, being southpaw, being quick, and being younger. Larry, why is Michael Nunn, after being so successful standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, suddenly started to dance around the ring? Well, I think it's, it's safer from his standpoint because, again, the style of Marlon Stalin coming with his head. He does throw more punches like now inside, but he also has a chance to set his man up on the outside. But it is when Nunn goes into retreat and begins to dance around the ring like that that his marketability comes into question. The Barkley fight proved one thing. It proved that he won't satisfy the public simply by winning fights. Well, again, if, he, if he's just trying to just satisfy the public and not stick to the right formula, it could be fatal for him. So you're saying it ought to be enough for him to win fights. It just, exactly, Jim. When you do what he's got you thus far. I mean, Michael Nunn does not have the body to, to be a puncher, inside puncher. I think once he wears his opponent down, that's it. then it's, a, it's safe to go inside, but not at the early stage.
The question has always been, would none make it to a level where the public would compel people like Ray Leonard to have to fight him? There's always talk, Jeff. But I think he has nothing to contend with here against Stalin. Coming alive, landed a right cross inside. Now Nunn comes back with a fury of his own. Stalin gives away too many rounds. A good action round. Good. Good. But Starling yeah, needs more than that. He ain't gonna take much more of this. You got 9, 10, 11, and 12. Sit back, let me get some water on you. Relax. Jimmy, leave that alone right now. The real champ come right. out now. That's right. Now the real champ none. come out See, none. I see. One, two step to your Look into his eyes, man. I'm telling you right now, he was fading that round. He was fading big time. You had him hurt. Mike, he had one flurry in that whole round. You had him hurt two, three times with those flurries. Once you daze him, none, you got to keep on him. <laughs> okay, here is a good toe to toe exchange as Starling opened up, landed something good inside, and took one almost at the same moment from the fast handed none. becomes another display of Nunn's multiple skills. And Starling has to climb out of a hole. Infamous clown. Yeah, and you said before the fight that he shouldn't clown. Look, he's always at risk when you clown like this, especially when a fighter is capable of throwing a big punch. Wins in no points from the judges. Look what he's doing here. <laughs> Wins in no love and appreciation from the fans. And the booing begins. Michael Knight has incredible hand speed, and that's what's so impressive about him. And you notice, Joe, every time that Michael has a tendency to show both, or either box, he gets really booed by the, by the crowd. And it really bothers him, too. And I think it bothers Marlon Stalin. It really doesn't help a fighter's morale because he wants to be impressive. He wants to be good. He wants to be great. Well, what fight fans want from Nunn is both fair and unfair. Most of all, they want him to go about his business without self-glorification and without the clowning. That's fair. They also want him to produce knockouts. And that, to a certain degree, may be unfair. Exactly, I would agree with that, Jim. I mean, Michael Nunn is not your one-punch knockout. Michael Nunn is a boxer. If you, if you really observe Michael Nunn's punches, and they come in bunches, come in like four or five punch combinations, but you'll notice that his punches, he punches with his arms, with speed, not with body. And the booing begins again. He excited the boxing public in the weeks following his one-round, one-punch knockout of Sumbu Kalimba. All of that excitement dissipated in the 12-round decision over Barkley. That fight there with Colin Bay, because Colin Bay was such a highly recognized fighter and champion, it was like a sin for him to have knocked out Colin Bay with one punch. Because now he has little to the expectations. I thought Starling uh, won that round. It's been a long time since he's won one in uh, my card. But you can't afford to give him any part of the round, all right, because it's too close. Only because you fucked around, you let him in the fight a little bit. Now listen to me, Mike. He's got his hands up so high, you either got to come up the middle or you got to go around to the body. Sit back and take a deep breath. Come on. Okay, the places. Good shot, okay? And come back with the left hook right hand, okay? Yeah. Freeze and four punch combination, not one at a time, okay? All right? 
Let's go. Get the hook right up against okay? The hook right up against gonna work against this guy now, okay? Check. Take it. You know what I'm saying, Mike? Okay. He's got the hands up, you gotta come up the middle on him when you're inside. You gotta hit the liver, you gotta hit the body, gotcha. but you gotta get in there with the jab left hand. Body, okay? Then the you'll come in for the headshots, okay? If there's any problem in conditioning with none, it might have showed in that last round, but I, I can't honestly say that I see him as tired yet. That clowning usually is to buy time. And the booing begins again. How does that affect none in the ring, Ray? He, he knows it's there. He knows it's for him. You'll notice that Michael now will become aggressive all of a sudden because of the reaction of the crowd. The crowd at times plays a, a significant role in one's performance. If not put out enough and the crowd starts booing you, you will become a lot more active. I don't think the crowd is, uh, is booing none. I think they want to see more action, they want to see more competition. Uh, but I think that's up to Starling to do something about this. They could probably be booing both fighters. <laughs> I think you're wrong. I think they're in the habit of booing none now. I think it's a habit that developed as a result of the Barkley fight and all the abuse he took in the media and from fans as a result of that. You may be right. If Marlon Starsman ever throw an overhand right, a Ken Norton right hand, is now or never. Good punch by Michael Knight. Michael Knight, he turns his head, he anticipates a right hand. Now, what, what Starch do should back off and get some leverage here. kind of shots that slows a big man down. Those shots to the body. Drill those shots to the midsection. It may be a little late, though, for Starling to be working to the body and trying to slow none down. That might have been a better idea back in rounds three and four. Solid left hand from Starling, but he's landed enough with the right hand to show that he probably can't hurt none. But also, Jimmy, I must, you must be fair. It's tough to look good against Ball and Stalin, too. And to a growing chorus of boos, Nunn returns to his corner where Joe Goosen works while trying to forget about a great disappointment for him that took place earlier today. The Goosen camp is developing a young fighter named Gabriel Ruelas. 130-pound fighter, 21-0, coming into his battle today with journeyman Jeff Franklin. And Franklin was able to score a technical knockout, stopping Ruelas' unbeaten streak because of an elbow injury that Ruelas developed in the middle of a fight he was thoroughly dominating. Watch this slow motion, and you'll see how Franklin was able to yank Ruelas' elbow. This is one round after Ruelas had made it clear to ringside observers that he could no longer punch with the right hand. He had won the first six rounds and seemed for much of that time on the verge of a knockout. Now he has a loss on his record. He has gone to the hospital, and the diagnosis is not yet forthcoming, though the people in the Goosen camp believe it is at least a good dislocation and perhaps even a fracture. One of the most sensational-looking young fighters I've seen in a long time. He has a hurdle to clear now, and it will make him a better fighter down the road if he does. Chance. 
chanting in the crowd, it sounds to me as though some people are chanting Michael and some are chanting Starlet. So at least the interest is still here. Starling lands a right hand and a lot of people wake up. Marlinstown needs to get going now. He needs to throw more punches here. This is when you reach down, Jim. This is when you bring up that special little magical resource. There is no reason for Stalin to be backing away. What he should be doing is going forward. There's such a uh, significant difference in the size of Stalin and Michael Nunn. Because Michael Nunn carries away a lot better and much more of a full-fledged middleweight than Marlon Stalin. Here he's just measuring Stalin. I'm taking pop shots, just picking his shots. Nunn's great hands and feet, giving him a chance to dominate yet another round. Stalin is getting lazy, just laying back, relying on one punch, where we see Michael Nunn just putting his hands together. Punch after punch. Stalin has landed three left hands right on the kisser, but they don't bother Nunn, who is standing in to try to deliver more punishment. championship fight. Neither fighter seemingly in danger of leaving the ring anytime soon. My guess, Jim and Ray, is that the people who are unhappy with Nunn's performance here in Las Vegas are those people who bet the fight down from go. six to one to three to one. They bet on Starling because I think Michael Nunn looks pretty good right here. Sit back. Sit back and take a couple deep breaths now. Now, Moochie, he punches when he's punching, you punch with him, okay? These two outside, you're right down the middle. One, two, one, two, okay? Byron, straight and hard now. He's just as you can this round, put hooks after uppercuts after left hands. When you stun him, stay on him. You look good at one or two. Get up now, Moochie. Straight. Straight punches, okay? Touching down to the jab over here right first thing, okay? All right, go out there. Ping, ping. Hard. Hard, Moochie, okay? Pick it up now. Harold. Going into this last round, how do you see it? Larry, eight rounds to three, 107, 102, Michael Nunn. He's just too quick, just landing too many hard left hands. What we're saying here is that Michael Nunn is still the middleweight champion, and Marlon Starling is still the welterweight champion. Starling had hoped for a future path out of the welterweight division. He doesn't much want to fight WBA welterweight champ Mark Breland for a third time. Also, no one wants to fight Simon Brown. Another one of the welterweight champions. Simon Brown has a problem. Everyone avoids him. He's too good. He's that good. And also, right now, Stalin needs to be good. Good right hand. Once again, by Stalin. Overhand right is the one that out Mark Freeland in Columbia, South Carolina. That was the right hand that I was talking about earlier that bothers those tall southpaws. Because it comes on the blind side. You can't see it coming. Crowd is chanting Marlon, Marlon.
Kutcher comes in, he needs to throw something. All he's doing is working his way in. He's not throwing anything. I'm sure fatigue is set in because he's not as active as he was in the early going. Still in the bout. Cautioning none against low blows with a minute to go. himself against the bigger, younger, faster man, but the bigger, younger, faster man was just a little bit too much for him. I thought it turned out to be a pretty good performance by Michael Nunn, considering the fact that he's fighting a guy like a Marlon Stalin who's been around the block a few times. It's a tough fight. Stalin's not the easiest guy to figure out. In fact, he's one of the toughest to figure out. But he made himself a little bit easier today than we might have expected, particularly in the middle rounds. Well, you know, Jim, Stalin just got comfortable. He didn't throw enough punches. In fact, Freddie Roach's trainer just begged him to throw more combinations to be a little more physical. In fact, he wasn't uh, throughout the middle rounds. Starling looked as good as he's ever looked against Lloyd Hunnigan 14 months ago, and Daddy Futch, as trainer, was partial architect of that particular performance. Do you think he, uh, you think he may have done himself a disservice by getting rid of Eddie Futch? I think anytime you get rid of a guy like Eddie Futch, you do yourself a disservice. Uh, the fact of the matter is, here's a man who wants to be champion, who is champion, Marlon Starling, and wants to manage himself and do all the above. You can't do that. You need to concentrate on one thing. That's boxing. I'm told that ring announcer Jimmy Lennon is ready to give us the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, at 12 rounds of championship boxing, we have a majority decision, and here are the score totals. Judge at ringside, Gary Merritt scores about 114, 114, even a draw. Overruled by Judge Art Lurie, who scores about 117 to 111, and Glenn Hamada scoring about 118 to 110 in favor of the winner and still IBF middleweight champion Michael. Second to none. So the same two judges who gave none his majority decision victory over Iran Barkley in Ladies August. Credit him with victory over Marlon Starling here. And just as that decision was booed by some at ringside in Reno, some elect to boo it here. It's tough to be Michael Nunn, unbeaten, unchallenged, unloved. Total punches in the fight, Nunn, 975 to Starling, 682. Nunn landed more punches also, and that percentage, 32%, is way up from where it was in the first three rounds of the bout when he was uncharacteristically inaccurate. And right now, Larry Merchant stands by in the ring. Larry? All right, uh, Michael Nunn. Yeah. Michael, you've been through a lot of turmoil recently. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us how you feel about the turmoil and coming through all of this finally. Well, psychologically, I'm real tired because throughout the last two or three weeks, I had to put a lot of things behind Michael Nunn, but that proved the great champion I am. And you like to tip my hat to Marlon Starlin. He's a very tough competitor. He knocked out Mark Breedlin. He's beaten Simon Brown, the two reigning welterweight champions. And he got in you know, real good shape. And he tried to take the fight from me due to me having my management problems. But I thank the good Lord up above, the blessing Michael Nunn with the skills, the willpower, determination to keep on going. 
and I thank my family, thank everybody back in Downport well, for being behind Why me. did you decide at the 11th hour uh, last night, Michael, to go back to ha having Joe in your corner, Joe Goosen? Well, you know, I felt like Joe then went throughout my career, and it wouldn't hurt because he wanted to be in there just as bad. So I thought it was a heck of a combination, and we got together, and uh, we done what we had to do.